welcome to Heavy Story Telling. We're going to be reading story. But first up, you're going to be reading the Bible, and then you're going to be. No, first up, you're going to be doing the verse of the day with me, with a link. And then you're going to be reading the Bible, and then you're going to do snaps. Then you're going to be reading around the whole nine days. Sorry. And then. Oh, we will end off the video. I don't know why I had that. Make sure to hit like button, subscribe, and hit the bell and then miss another video. Let's get straight into James 5.10. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. That's a short part of the Bible. Now, we are going to be reading an entire chapter. So, hope you guys enjoy. Let's go straight into Romans. We're not straight into Romans. Right. Hello. How is everyone this evening? So, we are on Romans chapter 14. This is the English Standard Version. I think everybody's already got their Bibles open in here. So, I'm going to go ahead and begin. Romans chapter 14. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servants of another, the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains abstains in honor to the Lord, and gives thanks to God, for none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and of the living." Why do you pass judgment on your brother, or why, or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love." But what you eat do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. I just want to say that this is this chapter is 
a great stumbling block in the denominational system of America and probably the rest of the world as well. But um, we just can't get over the, the nuances of other people's beliefs. You know, these people want to worship on Saturday. These people want to... Um, want to sing praise songs. These people want to sing um, traditional songs. These people want to, you know, do the things that they want to do in the way that they want to do them as long as it's not contrary to this right here. Then go for it. Huh? No, it's not really about food and drink. I mean, that's part of it. Yeah, of course. Some people say, oh, don't drink. Some some denominations say there is no drinking allowed, no, none whatsoever. That's not in the Bible. But if that's their conviction, then that's their conviction. Don't judge them because they have a conviction. But also don't judge other people because they don't have that same conviction. Right? So that is a... Uh, okay, yeah. I, I can definitely go off on that. All right, so <clears throat> in the last chapter of Around the World in 80 Days, let's see, they were on the train, and I think they got attacked by Indians, and the Indians killed everybody on the train, and that's the end. Here's Kimberly to say what really happened. The Indians made it way too easy for you, Dad. And then the train crashed. Okay. So, <laughs> Okay, so what happened was the Indians... Okay, I'll have to start from the beginning. It was the Sioux. Um, what was the guy's name who... This, um... Fix? Fix. No. Two. Mr. Fogg was Proctor, fighting Proctor Colonel... Colonel Stamp. Yeah. Something. Iota? Colonel no. Proctor. Okay. So, um, Mr. Fogg, he was, he got into a fight with, fight. he got into a fight with Colonel Proctor a few chapters back, and, um, he said that next time he saw him, um, he would settle things. And Iota, and um, it was Iota, Fix, and Passapartu, one of the three, saw them and told the other two, well, saw him and told the other two, and they were, they were um, afraid that Mr. Fogg would get into a fight and then get hurt. So they tried to make it so that they didn't see. But there was um, a delay because I think it was cows or buffalo. It was bison, bison. It was wild bison crossing time, I guess. <laughs> and, oh, hello, two people. <laughs> and so the wild bison took a very long time to pass. Like, they said by the time the first bison were over the horizon, the last bison were crossing the track. So, um... Eventually, um, eventually Mr. Fogg found out about, I keep forgetting his name, I am so sorry. Colonel Proctor. Colonel Proctor. They fa he found out about Colonel Proctor being there and decided, you know what? Hey, Passapartout, you bought a bunch of guns, right? Let's have a shoot-off. <laughs> so they try, they try for the stop, but, oh, Granny Bear says, as long as it is, whatever un is unto the glory of God and not pride, we should not judge or criticize another's worship as we are not to judge another man's, um, God's servant, I think. And smiley face emoji. <laughs> um, so, but the conductor, they were trying to do a, um, a gun match, but the conductor said that they had to go right then. So, 
um, they decided to take the shooting match onto the train. They went to the very back of the train, and um, they made it so that the back car was deserted. And then they started the shooting match, and they were going to start when the um, train, when it went choo-choo, <laughs> I guess. And so, but it didn't happen, and instead they heard screaming. And it turns out a bunch of Indians jumped onto the train, and they were now, um, they were now attacking. Oh, I forgot the whole thing about the bridge. The bridge was kind of cool. Yeah. Should I go over that quickly? No. Okay, I'll do it afterwards. If you want to <laughs> listen about the bridge, then uh, listen to yesterday's, yeah. uh, the, last, the last one. The bridge was awesome. <laughs> and very American, apparently. <laughs> so... Then, um, Mr. Fix, well, Mr. Fogg, he was going to jump over to the front to stop the train manually, but Passepartout beat him to it and got there first, and the train stopped, but at the end it said something about Passepartout being not found afterward. And I'm going to hand it off to Dad. Passepartout was not found afterward? Yeah. It said a lot of people turned up missing, and um, among them was the Frenchman who courageously stopped the oh, train. You're absolutely Something right. like that. Wow. I'm going to hand it off to Dad, who's going to read. But when the passengers counted each other on the station platform, several were found missing, among others, the courageous Frenchman whose devotion had just saved them. And I would like to take this moment to remind you, I think that the main character is actually Passepartout, not Phileas Fogg. Although, they're both going around the world in 80 days. And let's get back on the whirlwind. We're in chapter 30, in which Phileas Fogg simply does his duty. Three passengers, including Passepartout, had disappeared. Had they been killed in the struggle? Were they taken prisoners by the Sioux? It is impossible to tell. There were many wounded, but none mortally. Colonel Proctor was one of the most seriously hurt. He had fought bravely, and a ball had entered his groin. He was carried into the station with the other wounded passengers to receive such attention as could be of avail. Aouda was safe, and Phileas Fogg, who had been in the thickest of the fight, had not received a scratch. Fix was slightly wounded in the arm, but Passepartout was not to be found, and tears coursed down Aouda's cheeks. All the passengers had got out of the train, the wheels of which were stained with blood. From the tires and spokes hung ragged pieces of flesh. As far as the eye could see on the white plain behind, red trails were visible. The last Sioux were disappearing in the south along the banks of the Republican River. Mr. Fogg, with folded arms, remained motionless. He had a serious decision to make. Aouda, standing near him, look, looked at him without speaking, and he understood her look. It, if his servant... Was a prisoner, ought he not to risk everything to rescue him from the Indians? I will find him, living or dead, he said quietly to Aouda. Ah, oh, Mr. Mr. Fogg, cried she, clasping his hands and covering them with tears. Living, added Mr. Fogg, if we do not lose a moment. Phileas Fogg, by this resolution, inevitably sacrificed himself. He pronounced his own doom. The delay of a single day would make him lose the steamer at New York, and his bet would certainly be lost. But as he thought, it is my duty, he did not hesitate. The commanding officer of Fort Kearney was there. A hundred of his soldiers had placed themselves in a position to defend the station should the Sioux attack it. Sir, said Mr. Fogg to the captain, three passengers have disappeared. Dead, asked the captain. Dead or prisoners, that is the uncertainty which must be solved. Do you propose to pursue the Sioux? To pursue the Sioux. That is a serious thing to do, returned the captain. These Indians may retreat beyond the Arkansas, and I cannot leave the fort unprotected. The lives of three men are in question, sir, said Phileas Fogg. Doubtless, but I 
but can I risk the lives of fifty men to save three? I don't know whether you can, sir, but you ought to do so. Nobody here, returned the other, has the right to teach me my duty. Very well, said Mr. Fogg coldly. I will go alone. You, sir, cried Fix, coming up, you go alone in pursuit of the Indians. Would you have me leave this poor fellow to perish, him whom every one present owes his life? I shall go. No, sir, you shall not go alone, cried the captain, touched in spite of himself. No, you are a brave man. Thirty volunteers, he added, turning to the soldiers. The whole company started forward at once. The captain had only to pick his men. Thirty were chosen, and an old sergeant placed at their head. Thanks, captain, said Mr. Fogg. Will you let me go with you? asked Fix. Do as you please, sir, but if you wish to do me a favor, you will remain with Aouda in case anything should happen to me. A sudden pallor overspread the detective's face. Separate himself from the man whom he had so persistently followed step by step? Leave him to wander about in this desert? Fix gazed attentively at Mr. Fogg, and despite his suspicions and of the struggle which he was, which was going on within him, he lowered his eyes before that calm and frank look. I will stay, said he. A few moments after, Mr. Fogg pressed the young woman's hand, and having confided to her, <sighs> bless you, having confided to her his precious carpet bag, went off with the sergeant and his little squad. But before going, he had said to the soldiers, My friends, I will divide five thousand dollars among you if we save the prisoners. It was then a little past noon. Aouda retired to a waiting room, and there she waited alone, thinking of the simple and noble generosity, the tranquil courage of Phileas Fogg. He had sacrificed his fortune, and was now risking his life, all without hesitation, from duty in silence. Fix did not have the same thoughts, and could scarcely conceal his agitation. He walked feverishly up and down the platform, but soon resumed his outward composure. He was now he now saw the folly of which he had been guilty in letting Fogg go alone. What? This man, whom he had just followed around the world, was permitted now to separate himself from him? He began to accuse and abuse himself, and as if he were director of police, administered to himself a sound lecture for his greenness. I have been an idiot, he thought, and this man will see it. He has gone and won't come back. But how is it that I, Fix, who have him in my pocket, a warrant for his arrest, have been so fascinated by him? Decidedly, I am nothing but a donkey." So reasoned the detective. While the hours crept by all too slowly, he did not know what to do. Sometimes he was tempted to tell Eoda all, but he could not doubt how the young woman would receive his conf confidences. What course should he take? He thought of pursuing Fogg across the vast white plains. It did not seem impossible that he might overtake him. Footsteps were easily printed on the snow, but soon, under a new sheet, every imprint would be effaced. Mm -hmm. Fix became discouraged. He felt a sort of insurmountable longing to abandon the game altogether. He could now leave Fort Kearney at station. He could now leave Fort Kearney Station and pursue his journey homeward in peace. Toward two o'clock in the afternoon, while it was snowing hard, long whistles were heard approaching from the east. A great shadow, preceded by a wild light, slowly advanced, appeared still, appearing still larger through the mist, which gave it a fantastic aspect. No train was expected from the east, neither had there been time for the sucker asked for by telegraph to arrive. The train from Omaha to San Francisco was not due until the next day. The mystery was soon explained. The locomotive, which was slowly approaching with deafening whistles, was that which, having been detached from the train, had continued its route with such terrific rapidity, carrying off the unconscious engineer and stoker. It had run several miles when, the fire becoming low for want of fuel, the steam had slackened and it had finally stopped an hour after, some twenty miles beyond Fort Kearney. Neither the engineer nor the stoker was dead, and, after remaining for some time in their swoon, had come to themselves. The train had then stopped. 
the engineer, when he found himself in the desert and the locomotive without cars, understood what had happened. He could not imagine how the locomotive had, been, had become separated from the train, but he did not doubt that the train left behind was in distress. He did not hesitate what to do. <clears throat> he did not hesitate what to do. It would be prudent to continue on to Omaha, for it would be dangerous to return to the train, which the Indians might, be, might still be engaged in pillaging. Nevertheless, he began to rebuild the fire in the furnace. The pressure again mounted, and the locomotive returned, running backward to Fort Kearney. This it was which was whistling in the mist. The travelers were glad to see the locomotive resume its place at the head of the train. They could now continue the journey so terribly interrupted. Aouda, on seeing the locomotive come up, hurried out of the station and asked the conductor, "'Are you going to start?' "'At once, madam. But the prisoners are unfortunate fellow travelers.' "'I cannot interrupt the trip,' replied the conductor. "'We are already three hours beyond time. And when will another train pass here from San Francisco?' "'Tomorrow evening, madam.' "'Tomorrow evening? But then it will be too late. We must wait.' "'It is impossible,' responded the conductor. "'If you wish to go, please get in.' "'I will not go,' said Aoda. Fix had heard this conversation. A little while before, when there was no prospect of proceeding on the journey, he had made up his mind to leave Fort Kearney. But now that the train was there, ready to start, and he had only to take his seat in the car, an irresistible influence held him back. The station platform burned his feet, and he could not stir. The conflict in his mind again began. Anger and failure stifled him. He wished to struggle on to the end. Meanwhile, the passengers, and some of the wounded, among them Colonel Proctor, whose injuries were serious, had taken their places in the train. The buzzing of the overheated boiler was heard, and the steam was escaping from the valves. The engineer whistled, the train started, and soon disappeared, mingling its white smoke with the eddies of the densely falling snow. The detective had remained behind. Several hours passed. The weather was dismal, and it was very cold. Fix sat motionless on a bench in the station. He might have been thought asleep. Aoda, despite the storm, kept coming out of the waiting room, going to the end of the platform and peering through the tempest of snow, as if to pierce the mist which narrowed the horizon around her, and to hear, if possible, some welcome sound. She heard and saw nothing. Then she would return, chilled through, to issue out again after the lapse of a few moments, but always in vain. Evening came, and the little band had not returned. Where could they be? Had they been found? Had they found the Indians? And were they having a conflict with them? Or were they still wandering amid the mist? The mist? The commander of the fort was anxious, though he tried to conceal his apprehensions. A night approached or as night approached, the snow fell less plentifully, but it became intensely cold. Absolute silence rested on the plains. Neither flight of bird nor passing of beast troubled the perfect calm. Throughout the night, Aoda, full of sad forebodings, her heart stifled with anguish, wandered about on the verge of the plains. Her imagination carried her far off and showed her innumerable dangers. What she suffered through the long hours it would be impossible to describe. Fix remained stationary in the same place, but did not sleep. Once a man approached and spoke to him, and the detective merely replied by shaking his head. Thus the night passed. At dawn, the half-extinguished disk of the sun rose above a misty horizon, but it was now possible to recognize objects two miles off. Phileas Fogg and the squad had gone southward. In the south, all was still vacancy. It was then seven o'clock. The captain, who was really alarmed, did not know what course to take. Should he send another detachment to the rescue of the first? Should he sacrifice more men with so few chances of saving those already sacrificed? His hesitation did not last long, however. Calling one of his lieutenants, he was on the point of ordering a reconnaissance when gunshots were heard. Was it a signal? The soldiers rushed out of the fort and a half-mile 
and half a mile off they perceived a little band returning in good order. Mr. Fogg was marching at their head, and just behind him were Passepartout and the other two travelers rescued from the Sioux. They had met and fought the Indians ten miles south of Fort Kearney. Shortly before the detachment arrived, Passepartout and his companions had begun to struggle with their captors, three of whom the Frenchman had felled with his fists when the, his master and the soldiers hastened up to their relief. All were welcomed with joyful cries. Phileas Fogg distributed the reward he had promised to the soldiers, while Passepartout, not without reason, muttered to himself, It must certainly be confessed that I cost my master dear. Fix, without saying a word, looked at Mr. Fogg, and it would have been difficult to analyze the thoughts which struggled within him. As for Aouda, she took her protector's hand and pressed it into her own, too much moved to speak. Meanwhile, Passepartout was looking about for the train. He thought he should find it there, ready to start for Omaha, and he hoped that the time lost might be regained. "'The train! The train!' He, cried he. "'Gone,' replied Fix. "'And when does the next train pass here?' said Phileas Fogg. "'Not till this evening.' "'Ah,' returned the impassable gentleman quietly. "'Chapter 31.' in which Fix the detective considerably furthers the interests of Phileas Fogg. Phileas Fogg found himself twenty hours behind time. Passepartout, the involuntary cause of his delay, was desperate. He had ruined his master. At this moment, the detective approached Mr. Fogg, and, looking him intently in the face, said, "'Seriously, sir, are you in great haste?' "'Quite seriously.' I have a purpose in asking, resumed Fix. It is absolutely necessary that you should be in New York on the 11th, before nine o'clock in the evening, the time that the steamer leaves for Liverpool. It is absolutely necessary. And if your journey had not been interrupted by these Indians, you would have reached New York on the morning of the 11th. Yes, with eleven hours to spare before the steamer left. Good. You are therefore twenty hours behind. Twelve from twenty leaves eight. You must regain eight hours. Do you wish to try to do so? On foot? asked Mr. Fogg. No, on a sledge, replied Fix. On a sledge with sails. A man has purposed such a method to me. It was the man who had spoken to Fix during that night, and whose offer he had refused. Phileas Fogg did not reply at once, but Fix, having pointed out the man who was walking up and down in front of the station, Mr. Fogg went up to him. An instant after, Mr. Fogg and the American, whose name was Mudge, entered a hut built just below the fort. There, Mr. Fogg examined a curious vehicle, a kind of frame on two long beams, a little raised in front like the runners of a sledge, and upon which there was room for five or six persons. A high mast was fixed on the frame, held firmly by metallic lashings, to which was attached a large brigantine sail. This mast held an iron stay upon which to joist a jib sail. Behind, a sort of rudder served to guide the vehicle. It was, in short, a sledge rid, rigged like a sloop. During the winter, when the trains are blocked up by the snow, these sledges make extremely rapid journeys across the frozen plains from one station to another. Provided with more sails than a cutter, and with the wind behind them, they slip over the surface of the prairies with a speed equal, if not superior, to that of the express trains." Mr. Fogg readily made a bargain with the owner of this land craft. The wind was favorable, being fresh and blowing from the west. The snow had hardened, and Mudge was very confident of being able to transport Mr. Fogg in a few hours to Omaha. Thence the train eastward, the trains eastward, run frequently to Chicago and New York. It was not impossible that the lost time might yet be recovered, and such an opportunity was not to be rejected. Not wishing to expose Aouda to the discomforts of traveling in the open air, Mr. Fogg proposed to leave her with Passepartout at Fort Kearney, the servant taking upon himself to escort her to Europe by a better route and under more favorable conditions. But Aouda refused to separate from Mr. Fogg, and Passepartout was delighted with her, her decision, for nothing could induce him to leave his master while Fix was, within, was with him. 
it would be difficult to guess the detective's thoughts. Was this conviction shaken by Phileas Fogg's return, or did he still regard him as an exceedingly shrewd rascal who, his journey round the world completed, would think himself absolutely safe in England? Perhaps Fix's opinion of Phileas Fogg was somewhat modified, but he was nevertheless resolved to do his duty and to hasten the return of the whole party to England as much as possible. At eight o'clock the sledge was ready to start. The passengers took their places on it and wrapped themselves up closely in their travelling cloaks. The two great sails were hoisted, and under the pressure of the wind the sledge slid over the hardened snow with a velocity of forty miles an hour. The distance between Fort Kearney and Omaha, as the birds fly, is at most two hundred miles. If the wind held good, the distance might be traversed in five hours if no accident happened happened, the sledge might reach Omaha by one o'clock. What a journey! The travelers huddled close together, could not speak for the cold, intensified by the rapidity at which they were going. The sledge sped on as lightly as a boat over the waves. When the breeze came skimming the earth, when the breeze came skimming the earth, the sledge seemed to be lifted off the ground by its sails. That sentence needs a comma. Mudge, who was at the rudder, kept in a straight line, and by a turn of his hand, checked the lurches which the vehicle had a tendency to make. All the sails were up, and the jib was so arranged as not to seem, as not to screen the brigantine. A topmast was hoisted, and another jib held out to the wind added its force to the other sails. Although the speed could not be exactly estimated, the sledge could not be going less than forty miles an hour. If nothing breaks, said Mudge, we shall get there. Mr. Fogg had made it for Mudge's interest to reach Omaha within the time agreed on by the offer of a handsome reward, as would be expected, of course. The prairie across which the sledge was moving in a straight line was as flat as a sea. It seemed like a vast frozen lake. The railroad, railroad which ran through this section ascended from the southwest to the northwest by Great Island, Columbus, an important Nebraska town, Schuyler, and Fremont to Omaha. It followed throughout the right bank of the Platte River. The sledge, shortening this route, took a cord of the arc described by the railway. Mudge was not afraid of being stopped by the Platte River, because it was frozen. The road then was quite clear of obstacles, and Phileas Fogg had but two things to fear, an accident to the sledge and a change or calm in the wind." But the breeze, far from lessening its force, blew as if to bend the mast, which, however, the metallic lashings held firmly. These lashings, like the cord of a stringed instrument, resounded as if vibrated by a violin bow. The sledge slid along in the, mist, in the midst of a plaintively intense melody. Those chords give the fifth and the octave, said Mr. Fogg. These were the only words he uttered during the journey. Aouda, cozily packed in furs and cloaks, was sheltered as much as possible from the attacks of the freezing wind. As for Passepartout, his face was as red as the sun's disk when it sets in the mist, and he laboriously inhaled the biting air. With his natural buoyancy of spirits, he began to hope again. They would reach New York on the evening, if not on the morning of the 11th, and there was still some chances that it would be before the steamer sailed for Liverpool. Passepartout even felt a strong desire to grasp his ally Fix by the hand. He remembered that it was the detective who procured the sledge, the only means of reaching Omaha in time, but... Checked by some presentiment, he kept his usual reserve. One thing, however, Passepartout would never forget, and that was the sacrifice which Mr. Fogg had made, without hesitation to rescue him from the Sioux. Mr. Fogg had risked his fortune and his life. No, his servant would never forget that. While each of the party was absorbed in reflections so different, the sledge flew past over the vast carpet of snow. The creeks it passed over were not perceived. 
fields and streams disappeared under the uniform whiteness the plain was absolutely deserted between the union pacific road and the branch which unites kearney with st joseph it formed a great uninhabited island neither village station nor fort appeared from time to time they sped by some phantom-like tree whose white skeleton twisted and rattled in the wind sometimes flocks of wild birds rose or bands of gaunt famished ferocious prairie wolves ran howling after the sledge passepartout revolver in hand held himself ready to fire on those which came too near had an accident then happened to the sledge the travellers attacked by these beasts would have been in the most terrible danger but it held on its even course soon gained on the wolves and ere long left the howling band at a safe distance behind After about noon mudge perceived by certain landmarks that he was crossing the platte river he said nothing but he felt certain that he was now within twenty miles of omaha in less than an hour he left the rudder and furled his sails whilst the sledge carried forward by the great impet impetus the wind had given it went on half a mile further with its sails unspread it stopped at last and mudge pointing to a mass of roofs white with snow said we have got there arrived arrived at the station which is in daily communication by numerous trains with the atlantic seaboard passepartout and fix jumped off stretched their stiffened limbs and aided mr fogg and the young woman to descend from the sledge phileas fogg generously rewarded mudge whose hand passepartout warmly grasped and the party directed their steps to the omaha railway station the pacific railroad proper finds its terminus at this important nebraska town omaha is connected with chicago by the chicago and rock island railroad which runs directly east and passes fifty stations a train was ready to start when mr fogg and his party reached the station and they only had time to get into the cars they had seen nothing of omaha but passepartout confessed to himself that this was not to be regretted as they were not traveling to see the site the train passed rapidly across the state of iowa by council bluffs des moines and iowa city during the night it crossed the mississippi at davenport and by rock island entered illinois the next day which was the tenth at four o'clock in the evening it reached chicago already risen from its ruins and more proudly seated than ever on the borders of its beautiful lake michigan nine hundred miles separated chicago from new york but trains are not wanting in chicago mr fogg passed at once from one to the other and the locomotive of the pittsburgh fort wayne and chicago railway left at full speed as if it fully comprehended that that gentleman that uh, that that gentleman had no time to lose it traversed indiana ohio pennsylvania and new jersey like a flash rushing through towns with antique names some of which had streets and car tracks but as yet no houses at last the hudson came into view and at a quarter past eleven in the evening on the eleventh the train stopped in the station on the right bank of the river before the very pier of the cunard line the china for liverpool had started three quarters of an hour before that is the end of chapter thirty one and you'll have to come back tomorrow to find out whether they get to cross the Atlantic in time. So I hope that you are enjoying the story. We are uh, hopefully uh, going to continue tomorrow and Tuesday and be able to finish this. Uh, we have some ideas in mind for, uh, for a book that we're going to be reading next. But let me know in the comments what your ideas are, and I'm going to go for now, and we will see you next time. God bless you. Have a good night.